As the United States entered the industrial age, cities across America trans... By 1900, thousands had uprooted their lives, seeking opportunities in the urban centers. Indianapolis was a lot like other northern cities at the turn of the 20th century. There was a lot of industrialization, urbanization. By the turn of the century, by 1900, there were something like 18,000 African Americans in the city. So it was constant growth. You look at the time period, and one of the things that had to be addressed were skill sets, the ability to do some of these jobs, even rudimentary jobs, somewhat different than, say, jobs in an agrarian society. So you're having these people who, a lot of them having been farmers, are coming in a rural environment or now in this more urban environment. So they're having to you know, find jobs that are going to supply them the, the money and the resources that they need to exist. But it didn't take long for the city or for African Americans within the city to realize there was, there was a greater need. There was a need of just kind of localization in terms of the community itself. And with that, you had the formation of quite a few women's clubs. The Women's Improvement Club of Indianapolis was one such alliance comprised of 20 African-American women representing a diverse range from the community. These women who formed uh, the Women's Improvement Clubs were responding to the necessity of coming together in group to address these problems that they couldn't address in an individual way. The Women's Improvement Club was established in 1903 by William Thomas Fox, Beulah Wright Porter, Ada Harris. Initially, they were founded to be a literary society, but it did not take them very long to recognize that there was a lot of help needed within the black community to address various issues, health being one of the greatest. They were very much seen as role models, and most of these women, if they did not have formal education, they were self-educated. And this had a great impact on the community because they looked around and they, they saw the needs of the community and they went about the business of trying to meet those needs. There weren't a lot of public accommodations for African Americans. You know, they had to be careful not to get sick in too large of numbers because there were just a set amount of beds that were dedicated to them at the city hospital. By 1905, they're operating an open air tuberculosis camp in the Brightwood area located here on the east side of Indianapolis because this was something that was very much needed just in terms of trying to quell the great rampage of tuberculosis. They were reacting to the fact that there was very limited and certainly not enough insufficient health care for blacks in Indianapolis. Over the years, the club successfully pressured local hospitals to treat more black patients, including an additional dedicated ward at the Flower Mission Hospital. The women even opened their own clinic and started the city's first nursing program for African-American women. Beulah Wright Porter was a school teacher and went back to school, got her medical license degree, became a doctor, and then went back to teaching. But a lot of her skills were used as it related to some of their tuberculosis work. I marvel at their ability to come together to try to meet those needs because these were women who very quickly assessed that they did not have the luxury of being individuals. But most interesting to me is that they were able to unify as it related to the women's clubs themselves because in addition to the formation of Women's Improvement Club in 1903, in 1905, William Thomas Fox gave the call for the establishment of the Indiana State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. And if you look through their minutes, their early minute books, it's replete with examples of them giving money that is to be turned over to aid the national federation. So they knew that this was a problem that was not going away. There were issues there that needed to be dealt with. And you know, these were not women who, who were financially sound necessarily, but these were women who knew how to organize and to reach out and try to secure funds 
for whatever it was they were doing. They weren't above using their own resources, as meager as they might have been, to contribute as well. The impact has been, has been tremendous. The, the greatest thing that I would attribute to them again is education, because I think these women were women who were not just organized, but they were passionate about what they were doing and how important collaboration is. Those are probably the three greatest things they gave us was education, passion, and collaboration.